attention. Thanks everyone for coming on the rainy afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Renee Duckworth, who's visiting from the University of Arizona. Give you a little background info on Renee. Um, she uh, did her undergrad at Wittenberg University and then received her master's at Auburn University and then went on to Duke uh, to do a PhD studying uh, plasticity in reproductive investment and behavior. She then went on to do uh, postdocs at University of Edinburgh and Harvard. Her recent research explores linkages between behavioral and behavior and dispersal and how these linkages influence colonization ability. She is the recipient of many awards and honors, including uh, the Young Investigator Prize from the American Society of Naturalists and the Ned K. Johnson Young Investigator Award from the American Ornithological Union. Um, so please uh, help me welcome Renee. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is my first time in Davis, and I actually uh, must say that I'm enjoying the rainy weather. And I, I don't mean that to be annoying. It's just that <laughs> Tucson the sun gets a little overbearing sometimes. So this is, uh, it, I'm really happy to be here. One of the most widespread patterns in nature is the remarkable fit between organisms and their environment. Yet the processes that produce such amazing adaptation are often poorly understood, and this is at least in part because most adaptations are highly complex traits that are comprised of multiple components. So for example, the ability of this bird to match its background is at least as much a function of its cryptic, cryptic plumage as it is of the behavior that gets it to the right background in the first place. Yet this active role of organisms in choosing and in modifying their environment is often ignored in evolution. And this is because the, our models of evolution often portray organisms as passive with the environment is actively driving selection. So here's a figure illustrating um, a sort of typical illustration of directional selection. We have a population of individuals that vary in some trait. This external selective force enters the picture, kills some of these individuals, and in the next generation you see a shift in phenotype. Yet this isn't very realistic because selection results from the interaction between organisms and their environment and organisms are far from passive. So, for example, we could modify um, this example and allow organisms to act actively choose their environment. And so let's suppose in this example, the mechanism of selection is that these lighter individuals are predated or on more often because they're conspicuous in their environment. Well, if they can recognize and move to an environment where they can match their phenotype to the appropriate environment, then selection or morphology should disappear. And in fact, in this case, the ultimate target of selection is integration between dispersal to a particular environment with the traits that enable individuals to perform best in that environment. And so this, these types of examples, I think, are really important in evolution, and this is the focus of my work, is not only understanding how these complex adaptations can evolve, but once evolved, what are their ecological and evolutionary consequences? So today I want to talk about three examples that we're currently working on, looking at the ecological and evolutionary consequences of this environment matching. First, I'll tell you about the establishment of ecological cycles and how the evolution of behavioral strategies are really important in this process. Second, I'll talk about how evolution of environment matching in one context can sometimes get organisms in trouble in another context and cause divergent selection or morphological traits. And finally, I'll look at the macroevolutionary consequences of this type of habitat selection and see how it can influence species diversification. So the main, for the first um, project, or the first topic that I'll talk about, the main empirical system that we study are two sister species, mountain and western bluebirds. And these two species compete for a limited resource. So both of these species are secondary cavity nesters which means in, that in order to reproduce, they have to have a nest cavity. nest cavity, but they can't make their own, and nest cavities are limited in the environment. And so this produces really intense, aggressive competition, both within and among these species for this limited resource. Now this competition is largely driven by the patchy and ephemeral nature of the habitat they depend on. And that's because historically, bluebirds depended on habitat created by fire. So fire comes through, it opens up the landscape, and it produces lots of dead trees. Dead trees are great places for nest cavities. 
Yet this type of habitat is very ephemeral. It only, it's, it's successional, so it only lasts for about 10 to, to um, 20, maybe even 30 years before the forest starts to regrow and it's no longer suitable for bluebirds to breed in. So in order to survive, these species must be able to continually recolonize new habitat. And in general, there are two strategies for colonizing such ephemeral habitat. Species can either disperse widely and be the first to show up in a new area, or they can disperse at a lesser rate, but aggressively displace those earlier arriving species. And I've shown in some of my previous work that bluebirds have evolved a combination of these strategies in order to coexist. And so um, the way it works is that new habitat, historically at least, was created by fire. It was first, it's first colonized by mountain bluebirds, which are more, the more dispersive species. They're in turn replaced by an aggressive dispersing morph of western bluebirds, which in turn are replaced by a non-aggressive phylopatric morph of western bluebirds. And then of course, forest succession <coughs> sets in and the cycle starts all over again. Now the key to understanding the coexistence of these two species and the maintenance of this cycle is the evolution of these two distinct dispersal strategies in western bluebirds where aggressive behavior is closely linked <coughs> to the propensity to disperse. And what I'll show you today is that the evolution of these strategies enables individuals to match their phenotype to the environment where they will perform best. And so the um, interesting thing about this cycle and about this system, though, is that we've essentially interrupted the cycle here in more recent times. And that's because in the, t in the turn of the last century, a few important things were happening, <coughs> deforestation and fire suppression. And both of these things were disrupting the natural forest fire cycles. And this had devastating consequences for a lot of the cavity nesting species that depended on this type of habitat. And in fact, many populations of bluebirds went extinct. Western bluebirds went extinct for much of their former range in the Northwest. So this map shows in the red places where they were once common and by 1940 were completely gone. And so these population trends continued for several decades. And it really wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s that people were having a sort of awakening, I guess. And they were noticing that those beautiful bluebirds that they remembered growing up with as children were, had completely disappeared. And so this led to a very well-organized effort, which of course meant calling in the troops. And people were putting up thousands <coughs> upon thousands of nest boxes throughout bluebirds' former range. And what they were doing is essentially creating millions of hectares of newly available habitat. This new habitat was rapidly recolonized by mountain bluebirds. And part of the reason for that was not only are they more dispersive, but they also have a wider elevational range. And so they had been able to um, um, persist in small populations at higher elevations that were less affected by some of the, the factors that had um, made western bluebirds disappear. Western bluebirds also recolonized these areas, but it was much slower. And so this figure shows the range changes over a period of 40 years. And as they were moving the range back eastward, they were once again coming into contact with populations of mountain bluebirds. And as they did so, they were rapidly replacing um, these populations of mountain bluebirds. And we were actually able to observe this rapid replacement in two of our study populations. So in this first population, it was 100% mountain in the early 90s, and in under 10 years, the species composition completely reversed. So this population is now stably at 100% <coughs> western. In the second population, we observed the beginning stages of the rapid shift. Western bluebirds showed up there in around, around 2001, and in just a few years, the species composition was 50-50 mountain and western. And so we were able, in this sort of novel environment, with this novel resource, see the second stage of this cycle occurring. But remember, what made this cycle work in the first place was the ephemeral nature of the resource they, de they depended on. And we've now taken the ephemeral um, resource of natural tree cavities, and we've replaced it with a highly stable and widespread resource of nest boxes. And so this not only has all sorts of interesting implications for the coexistence and the evolution of these species, but it also has one very important added benefit because we now have um, a resource and a habitat that's essentially man-made, we have a, a very a unique ability to experimentally manipulate this habitat. And so we've taken advantage of this by um, doing large-scale field experiments to dissect the mechanisms of this cycle. And so today I want to tell you about the, that work, and specifically I'll address the following three questions. First, are these 
distinct stra dispersal strategies adaptive? Second, do they have a genetic basis? And third, how are they expressed in the appropriate context? And so to answer these questions, we can really use the range expansion of Western bluebirds as a window into the historical process of colonization. This um, figure shows the location of my eight study populations in Montana. And the relative proportion of white and black in these pie charts indicates the relative proportion of Western and mountain bluebirds at each of those locations. And so the great thing about these populations is that they're all nest box populations, and we have very de detailed historical data on each of those. And so we actually know the first day that the first Western bluebird pair showed up to breed at each of those locations. So this population here is more than 40 years old, and this one here is only five years old. And so that provides a unique opportunity to look at how these strategies play out across these populations of contrasting, um, at contrasting stages of colonization. But in order to do that, we first needed a way of measuring aggressive behavior, the behavior that we knew was really important in um, mediating competition between these species. And so over the years, I've worked out an assay of aggression that takes advantage of bluebirds' interaction with the third species, tree swallows, who are extremely annoying to bluebirds because they're constantly trying to steal their nest box. But this guy is quite convenient for us because we can capture him, put them in a cage on the, at the bluebird's nest site, and measure their aggressive response. And the reason we were interested in using this third species is because we needed an assay of aggression that was independent of the history of overlap of the two bluebird species. And tree swallows co uh, occur across the ranges of both bluebird species. So this made a really nice independent assay of aggression. So for these trials, we um, record all the aggressive behaviors that we observe, and each individual gets an aggression score based on the scale you see here. And so when we went out and we measured aggression across the range expansion, we found a very interesting pattern. It varied with colonization stage, such that the most recently colonized populations were the most aggressive. So this figure shows aggression on the y-axis for my eight different study populations. And these are lined up on the x-axis in the order in which they were colonized. The gray bars here indicate mountain bluebird aggression, and mountain bluebirds are generally less aggressive. But the really interesting pattern is that in western bluebird populations, the most recently established populations at the very edge of the range are highly aggressive, and the older, well-established populations show much lower levels of aggressive behavior. And so um, this was a very interesting pattern, and of course we wanted to know what the mechanisms underlying it were. Well, the first thing that um, comes to mind when you see this sort of population variation is that, oh, maybe we have rapid evolution going on at the edge of the range. And that's the first thing that we thought about. If, if that was true, then we would expect these new populations to be colonized by a random subset of uh, individuals from the source populations, so to have very low or moderate levels of aggression. But then perhaps because of the unique context at the range edge, the unique circumstances there might lead to the evolution of rapid aggression in those edge populations. But of course, now um, that we know that, that aggression and dispersal are linked in this species, this means that there's another um, equally plausible explanation for those patterns. It could be that new populations are colonized by just a few highly dispersive individuals, and that over time, the reason we see those population differences is because older populations evolve lower levels of aggressive behavior. And so in order to um, test this idea, we needed to go into these populations and follow the next generation um, um, as they were growing up, the next generation after the colonizers, and to see how behavior was changing within populations. And so that's what we did. We followed these juveniles, um, followed um, birds for several generations to look at changes in aggression. So what we found is that aggression was decreasing rapidly across consecutive generations. So this is data from a population where western bluebirds had displaced mountain bluebirds in 1999. And essentially what we see is that the um, uh, initial colonizers were highly aggressive and over um, just a few consecutive generations, levels of aggression decreased rapidly. And so this supports the second idea that there's colonization of these populations by non-random subset of highly aggressive individuals with changes to lower aggression over time. But we weren't satisfied with just having that um, um, within population pattern. We really wanted to 
distinguish not only the temporal pattern of change, but we wanted to make sure that that um, pattern wasn't <coughs> unique to the context of the range expansion itself. In other words, edge populations might be experiencing something very different from interior populations and causing those patterns. So in order to um, investigate this further, we decided to experimentally replicate the, po the process of colonization. And so we, um, to do that, we can take our populations of known age and we can create new experimental populations paired with populations that are older that we know currently have very low levels of aggression. And we can see if new populations are colonized by highly aggressive individuals, no matter where they're located. And so to do that, we simply take a bunch of nest boxes. We go find some wide open areas where there currently are no bluebirds breeding because there are no natural nest cavities in these areas. You put the nest boxes up in the fall, bluebirds colonize them in the spring, and then you can go in and measure the phenotype of the initial colonizers. And so for this experiment, we had the following predictions. If what we were seeing was rapid evolution of aggression, perhaps unique to the context of the invasion front, then these new experimental populations that we created in the interior um, areas should be very similar to the older populations with which, with which they were paired and less aggressive than the populations at the invasion front. However, if these new experimental populations, if what we were seeing was an evolved colonization strategy in this species, then these new experimental populations should be highly aggressive, sim similar to the populations at the invasion front. And this um, pattern here is exactly what we found. When we looked um, at those new experimental populations, the initial colonizers were highly aggressive, and these populations are more aggressive than the older populations with which they're paired. And in fact, if we take this data, and we can plot it out in relation to the populations that were colonized naturally across the range, we see that these um, new experimental populations do not differ in aggression from the populations at the invasion front. So this is the same data I showed earlier, but now it's just Western Bluebird data, and now it's plotted in relation to population age. And these experimental populations fall out right along that regression line. And so taken together, this suggests that what we're seeing in this species is an evolved colonization strategy, such that new populations are highly aggressive every time they're colonized, no matter where they're located. Now if that's true, then we expect these strategies, if this is an evolved strategy, we expect um, these distinct dispersal strategies to be adapted. And so um, if, if there's selection for co-expression of aggression and dispersal, the important thing to remember here is that it should depend on colonization stage. And so this figure is just to show kind of what I've already shown you, this observed decrease in the percent of aggressive dispersers as populations age. And so if these strategies are adaptive, then we expect aggressive dispersers to have high fitness in young populations, newly colonized populations, and the non-aggressive stayers to have higher fitness <coughs> in the older, well-established populations. And so to test this idea, we um, collected data uh, on lifetime reproductive success, and we use um, the number of genetic offspring that survived to independence for this measure. And what we found is that when we look within an older, well-established population, non-aggressive males have the highest fitness when staying. So this is um, um, data within a population that um, is well-established, where we have all four dispersal strategies. Non-aggressive individuals are in blue, aggressive individuals are in red, and these are the stayers, and these are the dispersers. And so within this older population, the non-aggressive stayers have the highest fitness. But the other strategy that we're interested in, the aggressive dispersers, actually have the lowest fitness of all. However, if we take those guys, and we compare their fitness across new and old populations, what we see is that the aggressive dispersers have the highest fitness when colonizing. And so this is data from the pair, our paired replicates of our new experimental populations and the older populations with which they're paired. And for this um, figure, we're looking only at data from, on reproductive success from aggressive dispersers. And so you see when they're colonizing new populations, the aggressive dispersers have much higher fitness than when they're dispersing into an older population. And so these results suggest that the link between aggression and dispersal is, is adaptive. But of course, that begs the question of what is the mechanism underlying these fitness differences across these different dispersal strategies. Well, in bluebirds, um, at least part of the story is explained by a trade-off between aggression and parental care. And that's because non-aggressive males 
feed their incubating female more on the nest compared to aggressive males. And in bluebirds, especially bluebirds breeding in northern Montana, this is very important. That's because the main source of offspring mortality in our populations is cold weather. I want you to note the date here. <laughs> so every single spring, in late May or early June, we get a cold snap that can last three to four days, and sometimes it can dump up to six inches of snow in these, um, on these populations. And these birds are currently in either in late stages of incubation, or they have very young offspring in the nest that they need to keep warm in order for those nestlings to survive. And so the female um, has a hard time during this period doing that as well as foraging for herself. And if all her male can think about is flying around and attacking other birds, <laughs> and he's not tending to his female in the nest, then this can be even more problematic. But we can um, quantify this in a little more rigorous <coughs> way. And we do that by placing thermocouples in the nest. And when we do that, we get um, data that looks like this. So this is showing a female incubation pattern. This is incubation temperature. And you can see that incubation temperature is um, around you know, 33 degrees Celsius with slight fluctuations that are indicating on and off belts of the female. So this is a normal incubation pattern. Well, what happens when the ambient temperature drops is female incubation patterns start to look something like this. And if female incubation patterns look like this for enough days or, or, or a long enough period, there's high offspring mortality. And, th and so what we found is that male feeding during these cold periods is really crucial for females to maintain normal incubation temperature. So males that feed their female more, their females are maintaining even um, incubation temperatures. And females that have very little change in their incubation temperature during those cold snaps are the ones that are producing the most offspring. And so this provides a mechanism for why these non-aggressive males do so well in these older, well-established populations, but it still leaves us with a few problems. And that's because non-aggressive males are not very good competitors. And so in order to have such wonderful reproductive success, they have to get a territory in the first place. So how do they do it? Well, we have some data that suggests that they do it through cooperation. And that's because um, if you look at males that return to their natal population to breed, Non-aggressive individuals are much more likely to acquire territory next to a relative compared to aggressive males. And in other studies, it um, have shown that um, cooperation among individuals in bluebird populations is really important, in, in, in this, in, even in territoriality. And so we think that these non-aggressive males are acquiring territories by simply butting off their parents' territory. Aggressive males, on the other hand, are benefiting by establishing new populations because in these new populations, they acquire um, territories that are more than twice as large in these older, well-established populations. And the reason for this difference right here is simply population density. These newly colonized areas have a very low density of bluebirds, and so they can essentially spread out and have huge territories, whereas these, um, these well-established populations have a very um, high density of bluebirds. And so um, what we have here is a picture emerging of two distinct and adaptive dispersal strategies in the species. We have aggressive males that disperse and compete for territories by colonizing new areas. We have non-aggressive males that stay at home and acquire territories through cooperation. And so this um, evidence that we have an evolved colonization strategy in this species, a strategy that's adaptive, made us um, start thinking about the genetics of these behaviors. And in particular, <coughs> quantitative genetic models suggest that if you have selection for co-expression of traits over long evolutionary time, then this should eventually lead to their genetic integration. And so we were really interested in whether there was a genetic basis to these strategies that we were observing. And so um, in bluebirds, we can um, answer this question because in the main population, the site that I've been studying for 10 years now, we have a detailed multi-generational pedigree. And we can use that to look at the genetic basis of these traits. So this is the pedigree, these horizontal lines, each of those indicate a generation, and the vertical lines um, link parents and offspring. And so this um, pedigree now has over 2,000 individuals in it and spans seven generations. So that means that this individual here, we not only know who their parents are, but we know who their grandparents are, great, great, great grandparents. 
So this provides a really unique opportunity to get a really good um, idea of, of genetic estimates of traits. And so using this, um, we use restricted maximum likelihood mixed models to analyze the pedigree. And what we found is that there was significant genetic variation in both of these behaviors. Um, this shows uh, the, the percent of total phenotypic variance split into additive genetic and residual for both of these traits. And so um, while it was really interesting to see this significant additive genetic variation, the main um, result that we're really after in this study was this, that there was a strong positive genetic correlation between these behaviors. And so what this tells us is that males that disperse are more likely to produce aggressive sons, and males that remain in their natal population are more likely to produce non-aggressive sons. So there's a stable association between these behaviors across generations. And so um, we now know that these strategies are adaptive and that they have a genetic basis, but the final thing we wanted to know is how are they expressed in the appropriate context? And this question really came out of the following observation. So we have um, this process of colonization that's a very dynamic process. And during this process, there's a rapidly changing resource availability. And that's because you have newly colonized populations with a low density of bluebirds, but where there's a high abundance of extra boxes or, or dust cavities around. And in just a few generations, these population transforms into an older, well-established population that's dominated mostly by non-aggressive stairs. And uh, the work that we've done on this system, we know that there's selection um, acting, and we know that there's this bias dispersal, but even those two factors couldn't account for how rapidly we are seeing behavior shift within these populations. And so we wanted to see if there were other um, factors playing a role. And I should, I should pause and say here that we did a lot of work early in the system to show that the differences we were seeing were not due to behavioral flexibility or so, sort of rapid changes within generations. And so all of that kind of led us to start thinking, well, maybe mothers are the key here. And so the reason that we were, um, we were interested in maternal effects, and we were particularly interested in maternal effects because mothers are um, uh, placed in this unique um, sort of role of, of uh, potentially responding to environmental variation and being able to influence offspring phenotype in an adaptive way, um, in, in theory at least. And so for bluebirds, this, we thought this might be particularly important because at the same time that mothers are producing eggs, they're also com um, competing and defending their nest cavity from um, competitors. And so this, this seemed to place them at a unique role to, to potentially influence their offspring phenotype in response to local conditions. And not only that, we know from other studies in birds that there are frequently um, hormonal gradients across the laying order, and these hormonal gradients can often influence offspring phenotype and offspring behaviors. And so we wanted to see if these might have uh, an important effect on aggressive behavior. And so we marked eggs as they were laid, and followed them <coughs> through hatch, and then followed the offspring closely through to adulthood so that we could then measure their aggressive um, phenotype as adults. And what we found was very interesting. We found a significant relationship between hatching order and aggressive behavior, such that first-born males are more aggressive compared to later-born males. And so this was very interesting and very exciting to us, but we wanted to place that back into the, col the process of colonization and see if this maternal effect could be, be um, uh, basically adaptive in the species. And so to do that, we um, decided to experimentally manipulate the process of co or, or experimentally mimic different colonization stages. And so the rationale for this study was that in these newly colonized populations, you have a very low density of bluebirds. So there's lots of extra nest boxes around. And so in this context, females would benefit by producing non-aggressive sons that can simply butt off the native territory nearby. Whereas in an older established population, density is pretty much saturated, and in this context, <coughs> females um, would benefit by producing aggressive males that can disperse and colonize new areas. Oh, and I should say from the perspective of the female, the difference between these two conditions is the local availability of nest boxes. And so that's what we decided to manipulate. And so within a single population, we created territories that had either low availability of nest boxes or high availability 
And it, this group was created simply by adding a second nest box to a territory. And so for this experiment, we predicted that in the low availability group, females should produce offspring early in the laying order because these were the uh, aggressive uh, males that dispersed. And in the high availability group, they should be more likely to produce sons later in the laying order because these were the males that were non-aggressive and should benefit by staying. And this is exactly the pattern that we found. Females or mothers were able to influence their offspring colonization ability by adaptively um, adjusting the sex bias hatching order of their offspring. And so um, it, that's what this is showing here. So in the low availability group, females produced males early, and these are destined to be the aggressive dispersers. In the high availability group, females produced males later, and these are the non-aggressive stayers. And so this was data from our experimental population where we carefully controlled the number of nest boxes on territories. Well, we then went into a population where nest cavity availability varied naturally and looked at for the same pattern. And we found um, basically the same pattern. When females had um, very few nest cavity, extra nest cavities around, they were producing suns early in the laying order and the opposite pattern when there was a high availability. And so this um, results were really exciting because it suggests that females and maternal effects can act as a bridge during the process of colonization where you have these rapidly changing environmental conditions and you have <coughs> offspring phenotype where you have clear differences um, that the females can um, affect in an adaptive way. And so uh, we think that maternal effects play a really important role in generating some of those population level patterns that we are seeing. And so, um, just to summarize this part, um, we have evidence that these distinct dispersal strategies in western bluebirds are adaptive. We know that the um, very we know that aggression and dispersal are genetically linked, and we now know that maternal effects play a really important role in fine tuning the expression of these strategies to the appropriate context. And so, um, this cycle is. Um, Understanding this cycle has been, in, in understanding uh, this sort of historical context for the expression of these behaviors has been really crucial for us to understand what's going on in this system. But of course, we've interrupted the cycle right here. And so what that means is that in current populations <coughs> that are nest box populations, we should es essentially accumulate more and more of these non-aggressive, peaceful male bluebirds. Well, perhaps this was then a conspiracy all along. That's um, this is a, the uh, web page of the North American Bluebird Society. And the mission of this society is to provide as many nest boxes as they can and manage as many uh, nest box trails as they possibly can. Why might people want to do that? Well, of course, because bluebirds are the symbol of love, <laughs> hope, and happiness. And by creating all these nest box trails, that's exactly the type of peaceful bluebird that we're likely to create. And I should say that we, we actually even have some data for this because in some of our oldest populations that are now going on 40 to 50 years old, these populations are essentially very stably showing low levels of aggressive behavior, assuming everybody maintains their nest boxes in a very stable way. So in this uh, first part of the talk, I told you about how um, environment matching can be very important in the establishment of these ecological cycles. In the second part, I want to talk a little bit about how um, perhaps the evolution of habitat preference in one context can get individuals in trouble in a completely different context. And so by now it should be really clear that bluebirds are pretty much obsessed with nest cavities and nest boxes. And um, we know from other studies that all bluebirds prefer to have territories with multiple nest boxes. But we also know from some of my work that only the aggressive males are the ones that get these territories. And so what this means is that depending on how we place the nest boxes across the landscape, we can essentially create little pockets of aggressive versus non-aggressive um, males across the landscape. And so we decided to um, carry out ex an experiment in one of my populations where habitat varies widely across the site. And we um, placed in open habitat a very high density of nest boxes. And in the closed habitat, there was a very low density of nest boxes. And um, just as we predicted, aggressive interactions sorted males into these two distinct habitat types. So we had 
highly aggressive individuals that acquired territories in the open habitat, where they got territories with multiple nest boxes, and non-aggressive individuals were pushed out into the closed habitat, where they got territories with only a single nest box. But the um, really interesting thing about this whole experiment is that we know that bluebirds forage very differently depending on the type of habitat that they have in their territory. So bluebirds that settle on, settle on closed um, territories with lots and lots of trees and lots of places to perch essentially use all the same foraging strategy. They perch, they search the ground for insect prey, they drop down, and then they go back up to their perch. It's a very low energy foraging strategy. Whereas if they settle on open territories where there are no perches, they have to use very high energy like hovering strategies to um, capture prey. And ecomorphological studies in birds suggest that there are distinct morphologies um, that should perform best in each of the, using each of those foraging strategies. And so um, when we looked across the different habitat types, we found that there was um, di divergent selection or morphology in relation to habitat type. So in open habitat, males with longer tail and longer tarsi were favored, so larger males were, were favored in this habitat, whereas in closed habitat, uh, males with shorter tail and shorter tarsi were favored. And so um, the, it, it's, it's really interesting that on such a small scale within a single population, you can get this divergent selection or morphology according to habitat type. But remember, what got them to these different <coughs> habitats in the first place was their aggressive behavior. And so presumably, if we were to allow this experiment to go on long enough, we could get experimental integration of aggression and morphology in this species. And so in the first part of the talk, I, I talked a little bit about how um, links between traits, aggression and dispersal, can be maintained. And in the second part, um, I think this has, is very instructive for how these types of trait integrations might get started in the first place through this non-random association between habitat type and behavior. And so um, for the third section, I want to talk uh, just a little bit about some of the work that I'm, I'm currently doing on the macroevolutionary consequences of habitat preferences in this species. And so this work really stems out of um, the, the empirical work that I've been doing on bluebirds because it got me to thinking about um, the intense competition that these species experience over this limiting resource and how over evolutionary time this might sometimes get species into trouble. And so in particular, I wanted to look at whether cavity nesting behavior might impact species diversification. And so for this study, I was, um, I, I made the prediction that shifts to cavity nesting behavior might decrease diversification rate by increasing the rate of extinction. And that's because dependence on a resource that's um, so highly competitive for, um, comp that, that there's such high com competition for, might make species highly susceptible to rapid environmental changes. So that was the rationale. <coughs> and so to do this um, study, I constructed a phylogeny of the muscat capitae, of which bluebirds are a part of. It, this is a phylogeny of the starlings, thrushes, and thrashers. I used sequence data from GenBank, um, a Bayesian approach to generate the tree, and I gathered data, data on nesting behavior from the primary literature and species accounts. And so I used two um, methods for analyzing this data. I first used VISA, which is a binary state speciation and extinction model, and this is a model that uses branch lengths to estimate speciation, or it can estimate speciation and extinction rates separately. But I also um, gathered data from the IUCN Red List for threatened and endangered species to see if there was a higher proportion of threatened and endangered species among the cavity nesting clades. So first let me show you the phylogenies. Um, the cavity nesters are shown in red, and all other uh, groups are shown in blue. And you can see that the size of the clade, at least for the thrushes, the cavity nesters, I think bluebirds are right here, um, these are quite small. The red clades are quite small compared to the blue clades. If we look at the starlings and thrashers, we see a similar pattern. It's uh, a bit messier because there's more sh uh, shifts back and forth from cavity nesting behavior in this clade. But in general, <coughs> the cavity nesting clades are, are fairly small, and the blue clades, the non-cavity nesting, are larger. And so what our analysis showed that um, there was indeed a higher extinction rate in the cavity nesting clades compared to non-cavity nesting clades 
but that speciation rates did not differ between these two groups. And then there's a lot of assumptions that go into these models, so we were pretty gratified by looking at the IUCN red list data and finding a result that, can, that um, supported the analysis I just showed you. So we also found that the, there was a higher percentage of threatened and endangered species among cavity nesters compared to non-cavity nesting species. And so I think um, one of the messages to take from this part of the study is that um, a sh while shifts to particular behaviors in the short term might be beneficial, after all, it's quite good to place your offspring in a nice little box where it's hard for <coughs> predators to get them. In the long term, depending on other um, ecological circumstances, this could lead to higher ri a higher risk of extinction. And so um, I think that, that just simply finding links between habitat shifts and diversification rates is a very interesting um, um, idea. And so I started this talk trying to understand um, the evolution of behaviors, and in particular, those types of behaviors that allow <coughs> organisms to match and modify their environment, and how this um, might have important consequences for both the ecology and evolution of species. And so what I've shown you today is not only um, is this type of environment matching, I think, really common, but that it also can have really important consequences, not just for things like range expansion, but also for things like species diversification. And thank you very much. Dispersal strategy. Um, it seems to be that th they don't seem to be limited that much in the ter in terms of um, f food availability. It seems to almost be that the the territory, the type of territory they their ability to extract that food from a particular territory might be sort of <coughs> depending on an interaction between their morphology and you know the type of territory that they're they're breeding on. But we don't know anything about you know, whether they're sort of assessing food availability and making dispersal decisions on that basis. And I guess I should say, just from working with this system for so long, I mean, working with these cavity nesting species, they're so obsessed with nest cavities that it's, they're really, I mean, I'm, obviously there are lots of other um, resources that they depend on, but this seems to be the one that, that determines a lot of their decision making which I think is, is kind of what came out of that study on morphology. You know, instead of like p choosing a territory that you can match your morphology to and like forage the most efficiently in, they are going for the nest boxes, you know, and whatever happens, you know, whatever else happens, happens, <coughs> it seems like. Yeah, a couple of funny questions about the female effects. I was curious if you had a sense of the, the females that were dispersers, whether they were also from the aggressive if so, whether there were implications that that would have for their own um, parental care strategies that would be independent of their, the parental care provided by their partners? Yeah, so um, there's female bias dispersal. So females don't show the same kind of dispersal polymorphism, <coughs> I guess, that males do. Um, so almost all females disperse away from their natal population, and they rarely like cooperate with their relatives and everything. But we do measure aggressive behavior of females. So we know um, uh, a lot about like the, aggress uh, the aggression level of, of mothers. And um, something that we're looking at right now is whether there's any sort of interaction between that and this maternal effect. Because we think that it's not, uh, you know, it's not just their competitive environment that they're reacting to, but their own phenotype might be influencing that competitive environment as well. Yeah, it, there's the, uh, the sort of longer term picture on fire frequency and sort of creation of nice open spots for aggressive dispersers to actually get to. 
Uh, you know, nowadays it, it, the, the story fits together nicely that if you are at high density, you can make you know males that will get to good places for them. But right. did they have enough fires in the past, uh, or is there a sense of even variation among different places and how frequent fires were to have this all sort of fit together nicely? Yeah, and I, that's a really good question, and I think that um, fire is the most spectacular example of how new habitat patches are created. But anytime a tree dies, pretty yeah. much, you know, you're going to have at least like one <coughs> possibility for a territory. But the thing that's interesting about like um, the sort of we, we know that they're colonizing at pretty high densities post fire habitats, um, and so the the thing that is so interesting about that is that you have all this dynamic that can go on between the cooperative types and the aggressive types and all that sort of thing. Um, so. I guess the other, the other thing to note about this whole this whole thing is that um, fires coming back is a, something obviously that's really shaping Western landscapes. You know, like fire suppression could only last for so long, right? Um, and so one of the things that we're really interested in doing that um, I haven't had a chance to do yet, but I'm really eager to do this, is to go and start looking at the birds that are actually colonizing the natural habitat and see what the um, See how the strategies are, you know, exactly playing out there. But the but fire is really important in Montana and, and lots of the sort of interior populations. Along the coast, I don't think it probably is so much in, in bluebird populations because a lot of these are stable all year round and they they um, they depend on different or they they breeding in trees with different or trees that have cavities, but they have maybe a different sort of life cycle and that kind of stuff, so. So the flip side of that, what, what are the consequences of this well-meaning uh, nest box trail that just sort of <laughs> proliferated through the West? So what's that doing to the evolutionary dynamic of the system? And, and yeah. if these stable systems kind of arise, what is it that's gonna maintain this aggressive dispersive uh, yeah. morph in the population? Well, thankfully, not all people are c continuous enough to maintain their nest box trails for long enough time. They're so more ephemeral than the Yeah, they right? might be more ephemeral than I'm making them out to be. Yeah. But, um, but actually, it's, it's really interesting because there's a, there's a couple of consequences of that. First of all, we do see these stable populations of non-aggressive individuals, which maybe in the past didn't occur at such a high frequency. And um, secondly, it has implications for the coexistence of the two species as well. Um, now, I'm not worried about West mountain bluebirds going extinct because even though they overlap at lower elevation habitats, mountain bluebirds can escape western bluebirds at higher elevations. But one of the interesting things that we're finding is that the density at which people place their boxes, you know, they've got a big branch, they place them wide, they place them widely, if they've got a small spread, they place them all bunched together, will actually determine whether the two species coexist in that habitat or not. So density of the resource is another layer that is really important in determining, you know, the ecological interactions that are going on. Because if, if, if the resource is widely spread out, mountain bluebirds can actually, they can actually coexist for a while. Yeah, Judy? Yeah, I was wondering about, you started out with talk, talking about this displacement, and I'm wondering if um, uh, now it's nest box densities, which are probably higher in most cases mm -hmm. than they would have been you know, even after fire, so I, well, we don't know, but in any case, they're, they're pretty high. Um, and they're, and they're artificially all really great nest boxes designed with exactly the right size. Yeah, exactly. So I'm wondering if you have any feeling for our aggressive males that are coming in that are at, able to displace mountain bluebirds, because if that's the scenario you were envisioning before as a succession, mm -hmm. that might have been, we're talking about linkage over time, mm -hmm. that might have been more important than some of the factors that you're using experimentally here to, to get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So if the so basically the interaction between the species is that what you're yeah, asking so about? I can, I, maybe maybe I missed it, but I thought at the beginning of the argument was that there's a patch that opens up mm -hmm. and the mountain bird that's going there first, mm -hmm. and then they are displaced by the western. And in that case, you can see aggressive displacement of the western against the mountain. Yes. Mountain bird, it might be really important to be aggressive if you were. The yes. Western, yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. More so than yeah. in, perhaps in, in even than in the situation here. In yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's exactly the idea, is that the reason that um, it's beneficial to have, to be aggressive if you're dispersing, mm -hmm. 
is because you're going out into this environment where in order to get a territory, you're, you're going to have to compete with mm -hmm. the species that got in there before you. And, and um, mountain bluebirds are one of the, um, the, their biggest competitors just because they're so closely related and so similar in like size and everything. But there's a whole community of secondary cavity nesting species, including small mammal species and, and other bird species. So I think, I think being aggressive and dispersing <coughs> is really important um, if you're going to be colonizing a completely new area. So yeah. Are the passive males more likely to get displaced than by these other species of secondary cavity nesters? Yeah, it seems like once um, they're not, and the, I think the reason for that is once western bluebirds have sort of taken over an area, you don't see mountain bluebirds, for example, coming back in. And that's because they breed at like twice the density that mountain bluebirds do. So once they sort of get a foothold in there and they sort of saturate the population, it's not a very attractive place for mountain bluebirds to, to come back and breed in. So they, um, you, would ex you would expect that maybe they could compete you know, with the non-aggressive individuals, and they should be able to, but they're simply you know, not choosing to, to go to these areas that are highly saturated. But the non-bluebird species? You're just saying they're Yeah, I don't, um, the bluebirds are dominant to a lot of the other species, just like tree swallows are smaller than them, and um, a lot of those, there's all sorts of different strategies. There's like slight habitat preference differences, and then there's also like tree swallows are, um, breed later, so they will harass the heck out of bluebirds. And as soon as, if, if a bluebird, you know, is is uh, not paying attention, they'll get into their nest box. But as long as the bluebirds are vigilant and aware, they're not gonna they're not gonna get in there. But they often bluebirds often fledge and tree swallows go in right after them or something like that. Yeah. So in years where there isn't snow, uh, I mean, I don't know if that ever happens. But, uh, do the aggressives actually do better then? Uh, and, and if so, uh, what's the prediction for climate change there? <laughs> right. So um, I was trying to, so I, this is actually, actually data that I just, I'm sort of still in the midst of analyzing. But I was, I'm, I was using survival models to um, look for the interaction between aggressive phenotype and weather patterns and on survivability of offspring. And what I expected to find, what, or what I was, my prediction was that there should be this interaction where, um, you know, in good times, they both do well, and, um, or, or in only aggressive ones get nailed during the bad times or something like that. Well, it was kind of the opposite. Basically, be, having an aggressive father is almost like being caught in a snowstorm. <laughs> like the aggressive, the, the offspring from aggressive fathers were having this like as poor success as a non-aggressive father in happy, wonderful weather. So it seemed like there was very consistent. So it's more than just basically it's more than just this interaction with the weather. Aggressive males we don't. We don't know all the details of what they're doing badly as fathers, but they seem to be doing multiple things badly. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you think the uh, mothers are mediating um, this selection of males, either from the early part of the brood or the late hatching part of the brood? Oh, right. Yeah. So this is. Um, do they kick, do they, if they want a late male, do they kick the early ones out? No. Nope. Stop no. Feeding them or what? No, it's completely something that's so in birds, females are the heterogametic sex. So we think it's something that's occurring um, in the process of uh, you know laying eggs in in meiosis and all that sort of thing. Now that said, this is this these sorts of patterns have been shown in birds for for several years now, and the exact mechanisms by which female physiology can change the order of the sexes that she's producing or bias the sex ratio of her brood are not known. But I think that there's some really intriguing stuff that suggests that um, interactions between like, you know, stress hormones, for example, during the time of ovulation can have uh, potential impacts on um, biasing meiosis or something and, and, and creating these sort of not in an active way, but in a, in a passive way. Like the female's just doing something that causes some sort of stress and that sort of gets, that 
in some way gets translated into differences in um, the, off the order of the offspring that she's producing, if that makes sense. If that, and if that's also coupled to the that's hormones That's basically that, just about uh, sex determination, right? There's not mm -hmm. some kind of way that this, right. you're suggesting the genetic, yep. other than sex, the genetic composition of the offspring can be altered? No, yeah, it's, it's about sex determination, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and it, like, uh, we don't know the mechanism yet, but there's several, there's sort of, um, there's lots of things that go on that could be biased by the hormonal milieu that's occurring during ovulation. So that's, I guess, you know, an area that is ripe for investigation. Yeah. Thank you. One more question. But really, this is happening over just a matter of days, and then they make a day. Mm -hmm. So she's monitoring this thing over a 24-hour period? Yeah, I don't know. Like the the uh, this is actually what I'm studying right now is trying to figure out what the mechanisms of this maternal effect are, and so the sort of working hypothesis I have is that we know that early in the breeding season, right when females are laying eggs, that's when they're interacting with a lot of um, um, other species that are trying to sort of steal their nest box from them before they actually have their clutch in there, and so it's possible that having these extra cavities on your nest make this a really attractive, sort of attract lots of competitor species to, there, to, the, to that territory. So if females are um, interacting more, defending their, the, the, the nest box more because of this sort of attraction thing, then this might influence her testosterone, corticosterone levels, I don't know, some, some sort of hormonal levels that could then maybe um, change the sort of gradient she's placing in her clutch or, or something like that. So right now what we're trying to figure out is, like what we're gonna do this um, summer actually is repeat that experiment, but this time pay really close attention to female behavior and female physiology and see if we can figure out what differs between females that are on these territories with lots of resource versus little resource. That's not gonna get us all the way to the answer, but it'll at least get us a little bit closer. Cool. Um, why don't we uh, continue the conversation at the No Host Dinner at Katmandu Kitchen, 545. Thanks so much.